I'm here with Pastor Yeo. He's going to share some testimonies from BSS yeah. in Portuguese. Yeah. Wow. I have some, I have two testimonies actually. Um, one testimony just happened. Um, Chris was in Brazil. He was ministering in Brazil. We had a huge team in Brazil for the School of Prophets for the very first time in Brazil. And we've heard some crazy testimonies, but one of them that I want to share with you guys. Um, one lady, she's from India, and she went to the conference. And I, I think in that moment, she didn't have anybody to translate to her. She didn't speak English or Portuguese. She just came to receive a, a prophetic word or a prophetic encouragement. And the, one of our students, we had around 200 BSSM Portuguese students serving at the conference. This is amazing, right? They travel from all over the Brazil to, 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 the, to the place where the conference was happening. And she came, that lady from India, she came to receive the prayer and... I don't know, like she did like some sign, something like that, that she wanted to receive prayer. And the, the student of ours that was ministering to her, she fell from the Holy Spirit to just touch her back. And she started to pray because she didn't know what, where the pain was or what the, the, the lady needed. And she started to pray and suddenly the, the lady from India just felt like a shift and the pain that she was feeling in her back for several years, suddenly, 15 years? 15 years. Yes. 15 years just went away like that. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And another one that, that happened during the immersion week that we have very few weeks ago, um, a lady, she came to the healing rooms just to like to, to, to bring a friend and while the friend was receiving uh, prayer, she was reading the paper and suddenly she saw like, oh, eyes issue. And suddenly she was like, eyes issue? Like she realized in that moment that she could read in that moment without receiving prayer, without like anybody just dancing over her, nothing. Just out of the blue, the Holy Spirit came and healed her. This is amazing, right? This is amazing. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, and even tonight before this service, we were together as a team and we kept feeling the year is not over yet. For so many of you, you walk into here tonight and there are so many things you've been asking the Lord for for this year, dreams you've been praying for, things you have been expecting. Maybe is the healing for someone for your family, maybe it's a dream in your heart. Whatever it is, I just want to declare tonight, the year is not over yet. The Lord can still do so much with a month left. And I want to read a psalm tonight before we start. We're going to read out of Psalm 89, verse 5, that says, The heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? Who among the sons of mighty is like the Lord? A God greatly feared in the counsel of the holy ones and awesome above all those who are around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is like you, O mighty Lord, your faithfulness also surrounds you. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, let's pray. Jesus, thank, thank you. you we give you thanks. Thank you, we just came out of a week that we were celebrating Thanksgiving, but we want to give you thanks for thank everything you, that you have done and everything that you're doing still, and everything that you will do because you are faithful. This is your nature, God. You're a faithful God, you're a faithful Father, and we praise you, God. We praise you, we praise you, we praise you, and we love you, Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen. 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 Yeah, go around and just say hi to two or three people around you and just say, the year is not over yet.
Yeah, just lift up shouts of praise in this moment. Yeah. Lift up praise. Lift up praise. Lift up praise unto the Lord. Lift up praise. He's amazing. You're amazing, Lord.
is enough, more than enough. We join with the faith of heaven, forever enough, always enough, more than enough. Yes, that's who you are, forever enough, always enough, more.
rejoice in who you are, my Lord. You've never let us down. Oh, you never will. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That. Just a couple more times. That is who. I'm so glad that that is who you are, Lord. It's who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. Let's sing Jaira one more time. You are Jaira. And you are in love. Jaira.
celebrate the gospel of Jesus. We celebrate your gospel, Jesus. Oh, thank you for your blood applied. can we say thank you is not enough Jesus your grace and mercy poured out for us I will love you forever here on earth into heaven we've been washed from the inside hallelujah hallelujah Hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it was the blood, could have only been the blood, could have only been the blood of Jesus. Because it's never been about performance. Perfection or striving for acceptance. Let me tell you, it's only by the blood. It's never been about deserving. <laughs> it's a gift that's free to give. Let me tell you.
power in His name. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. It, it, it's twice in the Old Testament that God is referred to as the God of the breakthrough. Jehovah Peret C. I hope I got it right. Uh, turn to someone next to you and say, it's time for breakthrough for you. When it appears in Samuel, it's the God that bursts through. And when it appears in Chronicles, it's the God that breaks through. Uh, have you ever heard the, the American term that when the stakes are high? Have you heard that? It means when it's really intense, all the chips on the table, it's, it's like, whoa, here we go. Uh, let me tell you a story. I was uh, invited to a meeting. I won't tell you where and when, but this leader, he trusted me and he thought he'd, he'd use all his relational equity to get 12 senior pastors in the room that were not super excited about maybe the, the manifestation or the move of the Holy Spirit in their communities. And, he's, and he, he used his relational equity. He said, just, just come and listen to my friend. And I remember the, the day before, the hour before, I was so nervous. And the assistant pastors and after the 12 senior leaders, there was gonna be 300 staff that gathered of all the churches and they were gonna minister in the Holy Spirit. And remember, they're really nervous or just reluctant. Amazing people, they're all my friends. And uh, the assistant pastors leant over to me and they said, Rich, the stakes could not be higher. And as they said that, I heard the Holy Spirit whisper to me and He said, I always come through when the stakes are high. And let me tell you, when there was those 12 leaders in the room that I was really nervous that, that they were gonna be in the room, started to share about the joy of the Holy Spirit, the move of the power of God. Oh, and then got to minister to 300 of their staff and we saw the power of God touch them. And the leaders turned to them and they said, it couldn't have gone better. And I turned to them, I said, but when the stakes are high, God always comes through. I, I don't know about you, we've been singing about the blood that makes a way, breakthrough. We've been singing about a grave that God emptied, breakthrough. And we've been singing about a name that in that name there is power for breakthrough. Uh, if you hear and, and you have a family situation where the stakes are high, maybe there's a brother that's in rehab, maybe you're here and, and your mother, uh, she's in an ill place and the stakes are high. Maybe you're working a, alongside a, a business and it feels like everything's falling apart. The stakes are high. Maybe you, maybe you, you with your finances, you're in the like, spot. And you're like, the stakes are just so high. Maybe there's a relationship that you're in and it just feels like the stakes are so high. If there's anyone out here with the stakes that are high, lift your hand with me. I wanna tell you that God comes through when the stakes are high. Because He's the God of the breakthrough. This, this isn't a false hope. This is the hope of the world. This isn't a, a, a rally talk to, to a bunch of sports, a sports team. This is the hope of the world. This is Jesus Christ who could take an, a suicidal eight-year-old boy like myself for 10 years struggling with suicide and the hope of the world can come in. He is the God of the breakthrough. Oh, some people think you can never get off meth. 
He is the God of the breakthrough. Some people feel they'll always be stuck in that financial situation. He is the God of the breakthrough. You've been diagnosed with an illness that the doctors say you will never, ever be able to get rid of. Let me tell you, He is the God of the breakthrough. I want you to hold that high stake situation in your hands right now. And we're gonna sing the name of Jesus over this high stake situation because religion can just, religion can reform you, but it can't transform you. You need the God of the breakthrough for transformation. There's no name higher, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 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 Lift your voice, lift your voice. Feel the anointing in the room. There's power in the name of Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't know this God that breaks through, there is only one true God. There is only one way to heaven. And through this narrow gate, through this narrow gate we walk. If you've come here, and somebody's dragged you to be at church, or you've come because you're interested, or you found yourself far from God, I wanna tell you that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And you'll be like, oh no, me? I'm stuck. Jesus loves you. He died for your sins, and then He rose again three days later. He walked amongst man and then He ascended on a cloud 
and He sent the Holy Spirit to be with you. It's the craziest story. Uh, Often people think it's so simple, but it's pretty wild. It's a wild story. It's a wild, wild story. And every time someone says, I I wanna believe in that, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. But for 2,000 years, there's been miracle after miracle after miracle. If you fear and you found yourself, I don't know, I don't know where I'm at with God. I don't know what would happen to me if I died today, if I'd go to heaven or, I wanna invite you to respond. I want to invite you to respond to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's the God of the breakthrough. That high stakes situation, He wants to come in, but He wants you to surrender. Uh, If that's you, and you would say, hey, I I, I want to accept Jesus Christ into my heart tonight as Lord and Savior. I'm far from God, maybe I don't know God. I, I don't know where I stand with Him, but I wanna accept Him fully into my life as Lord and Savior, I want you boldly with every eye open here, I want you boldly to raise your hand as quickly and as high as you can. As quickly and as high as you can. I I see you, I I, I know last, I see you over there. Oh yeah. I see you over there. I see you waving me, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, can some of the church just that are around her just go to her and start praying for her? I see you, Alicia. Just go to her there and pray. Uh, if you're here and uh, and you don't know if you're right with God or not, don't leave this place. Don't leave this place questioning. Don't leave this place. Uh, Dylan, why don't you come on? We had the beautiful opportunity of taking communion together, getting to celebrate the salvation. Yeah, if you um, wouldn't mind grabbing elements uh, that would have been passed out to you at the entrance, if you do not have an element, uh, just raise your hand and our ushers Uh, I'm going to walk around and find you. We just have a few people on the back here. If you have a spare element next to them, why don't you be generous? On the back left and back right. Keep your hands raised. And a few down here in the front. of the breakthrough. Amen. Amen. So I'm just going to read this passage over, over you and then we'll get started. This is in Luke 22. It's just before Jesus dies. And in verse 14, it says, And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. 
and he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. Thank you, Lord. Before we take the elements, I just wanna highlight how the scripture very purposefully describes this taking communion. Jesus says that this is my body and this is my blood. It's not a routine or a ritual or a, a religious moment. It is a partaking in divine communion in full agreement with what Jesus accomplished on the cross. It is a mind, body, and spirit alignment into the truth of the gospel. Amen. Okay, why don't you stand with me? We'll take the elements. And if you can, when you just take the bread. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So just hold the bread. And the bread is a representation of the body of Christ that was broken and bruised for our iniquities. And in the same way, the scripture in Isaiah 53 says, by his stripes, we are healed. A definitive agreement with the finished work of the cross. And so with the bread in your hand, I want you just to declare, by your stripes, I am healed. By your stripes, my mind, my soul, and my spirit is healed. God, we just declare over this room, every doctor's report that stands against this truth, we declare, Lord, the power of the gospel in remembrance of your body, Lord, to bring full healing in Jesus' name. We command cancer to bow its knee in Jesus' name. Lord, we command schizophrenia, every disease of the mind to bow its knee in Jesus' name. Oh, we command blind eyes to open, deaf ears to open in Jesus' name. Anything that dares to raise its head against the finished work of the cross. Lord, we speak your full and complete healing that by your stripes, God, we are healed. If there's a, a family member or someone you know, just speak them out by name and declare by the blood, by the stripes of Jesus, they are healed. Thank you. Just speak out their name and declare the healing of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your body. We do this in remembrance of you. You can take the bread. Thank you for your blood, Lord. God, we thank you that 
it says in the scripture that before the foundation of the world, you were crucified. This decision to shed your blood was made before anyone could choose you back, the ultimate lamb and sacrifice. This blood represents the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our souls. And because we are so richly forgiven, we have the beautiful opportunity to forgive others. So I want you to just take a moment and if there's anyone you need to forgive, just get right with God and forgive them now. says that when we bless our enemies, when we pray for those who persecute us, we actually get revealed as children of God. That there's a revealing of the truth of who we are in God. And so I want you just to take another moment and begin to pray and bless your enemies. Pray that they would have an encounter with the truth of Jesus that they would have the joy of serving the Lord for the rest of their days. Pray for a blessing upon their household. Lord, we pray for a blessing upon their finances, that you would pour out your riches and your grace upon them, that you would shower them with favor, with goodness, with generosity. We pray, everyone, that persecutes or is against us, Lord, we pray for this extravagant blessing of heaven over their lives. In Jesus' name. And then lastly, what the blood has done for us, it can do for anyone. There's no situation more powerful than the blood. And so I want you to think of anyone, maybe a family member who does not know the Lord or who has turned away and I want you to call them by name and I want you to plead the blood of Jesus over them. So right now, thank you, God. I just thank you. Thank you, God, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the power of your blood. And Lord, what you've done in us, would you do in our families? That we, by your blood, would have the joy of seeing them more sold out, more on fire for you than even we are, Lord. The extravagance of the power of the blood, in Jesus' name, can take the blood. give thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you did. Thank you, Father, for your extravagant mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can take your seats. Can we also give it up for the worship team? Hello, church. What's happening? I love, 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 love Sunday evenings. Uh, if you are a visitor with us here for the first time, wouldn't you mind just putting your hand up? We want to give you a warm Bethel welcome. Oh, wonderful. It's a whole lot of hands up. Can you just, uh, 
just keep your hands up. We have some ushers going around. I just want to get some of your information. So yeah, just keep your hands up. And then I want to invite two friends of mine up to the stage, uh, Laurie and James Burke. <laughs> they, they used to work for Bethel. They now are doing their own business and some amazing things. And uh, despite popular belief, James is not actually my brother. <laughs> uh, Do we look, from, from afar, online, they probably think we yeah, look like I, brothers. I've been stopped in an airport before and said, hey, I loved your class. And I thought, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I and James, I'm Clint. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we, we just want to prophesy over a couple of people quickly. So I'm going to let them go first and then I'll, I'll finish it. Yeah. So um, when they asked us about 30 minutes ago, hey, welcome to church. You want to prophesy? Prophesy. When you come to Bethel, you just always, you stay ready. Um, so what I was thinking about is um, specifically Rich kind of touched on it a little bit about breakthrough moments, but uh, something on my heart was uh, people who are in seasons of transition, vocational transition, um, uh, like dream transition, you're hoping, waiting, wishing for a dream to, uh, to come to fruition. If that's you, I want you to stand. Uh, what I just saw really clearly is that um, a lot of people, a lot of people have been uh, kind of going around the mountain at the base when the Lord actually wants to take you out of the weeds and, and give you a 30,000 foot perspective. So I just want to bless you right now that the Lord is actually taking you out of the weeds and out of the, the day to day and, and he's refreshing your vision and your dream. And the thing that you think was on the back burner, I feel like the Lord is saying, I actually want to bring that to the forefront today. So right now I just bless you in the name of the, uh, the, name of the Lord that these dreams that you thought were far away are actually right around the corner. The vocational shift that you're hoping for is actually right in front of you. And I just want to declare um, it's easier than you think because he makes it easier when you follow him. So I just want to bless you all in the name of Jesus. Say, I, I receive that. Amen. And then uh, everyone, you can take a seat and then, yes, ma'am, you, and, I can't tell if it's, yes, you, you just turn around and is it red, pink? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't tell the color. I'm not colorblind, but Lamaya. Lamaya, um, there's, a, there's a prophetic, I want to say anointing, but there's this um, prophetic justice, healing, reconciliation call of your life, and you've wrestled with it, and you kind of, you, you have this bridge builder mentality in your life, um, and those are the best leaders. So I just want to call the leader within and say the Lord sees you. Not only does he have big plans for your life, but he's calling you in this season to train and equip the prophetic gifting, to not only have the prophetic fire to bring justice where justice needs to take place, but also to bring tenderness and mercy and love. So I just bless you in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Um, stay standing because I have something for you too now. Um, I feel like you're, you're waiting for something to happen to like do the thing. And I feel like just stop it. Don't wait. It's right now. You have nothing to wait for. Just do the thing. Just start doing it. However small it is, is not insignificant. Just start with the small thing, whatever that is. Just stop waiting. It's like the time is here and it's now. Okay, and then is there someone here with the name of Candace? There's a Candace here? Oh my gosh, I cannot believe there's a Candace here. That's so crazy. Okay, um, Candace needs courage is what I heard during worship. And so I just wanted to say to you, courage isn't the lack of fear. It's, it's doing the thing anyway, even though you're afraid and knowing that the Lord is gonna take care of you every time. So I just bless you, Candace, with courage for whatever it is that you need it for. Like, it's okay to be afraid and it's okay to be worried or anxious about it. Just know, like, the Lord has got you. You are, I feel like you are um, specifically equipped and ready for whatever this thing is in front of you and you keep second guessing it and going like, I need more training or education. I don't know, whatever it is. But I feel like you have it, you have what it takes. It's inside of you and you just need to take the step. So I just bless you with courage, supernatural courage right now. In Jesus' name, he will not let you fall.
This sounds good. If you're wearing the color green, can you stand up quickly? Green. The color green. A lot of greens. Look at that. Ch -ch I'm wearing green. So as, as I was walking up here, I felt the Lord say, I'm on green tonight. And uh, the picture that I saw, this is a strange picture, but I saw, and I'm prophesying of myself as well, is that I saw you working for the brand American Eagle. And, uh, and I was like, well, that's strange because I don't know if everybody here is going to work for American Eagle, but I don't think it's like literally, this is what I feel like the Lord's saying is the eagle represents the prophetic. And I feel like in this season, you're going to clothe the prophetic bride and teach people how the prophetic works. And I really feel like God wants to open up the seer realm to a lot of you who are wearing green tonight, specifically this lady right over here. You wear, I'm looking straight at you, wearing red sunglasses or glasses. You, yeah, you, there we go. Yeah, I, so I'm going to prophesy over her, but I want you all to take it or standing up in green. Uh, I saw the Lord just opening up your spirit realm and your eyes, but I felt like God said, hey, will you trust me with your imagination first, and then I'll give you the gift to see. And for all of you, I feel like God wants to increase your imagination first before he gives you uh, the sword of actually seeing in the spirit. So put your hands on your eyes quickly, and I'm just going to pray, God. I pray release of this in Jesus' name. I thank you that you would open up the realm of the seeing gift, God, but I pray that you'd increase, increase, increase the imagination, the creative gift of the imagination, God. We have the renewed mind and we have the mind of Christ, and I pray that you'd increase the renewed imagination in Jesus' name. All right, amen. Y'all can sit down. Thank you so much. Uh, one last person. Nicholas, are you here? There you are, bro. No, this Nicholas, that Nicholas, right over there. So I called you out last week, Sunday, you weren't here, so I wanted to honor this. Um, I, I, your name means uh, victory of the people. And uh, Nicholas, I just saw you as, a, as, as God's victory. And I saw him holding a shield with your victory and your life victory on it. And I feel like there's an evangelistic gift of you, Nicholas. And your story is going to become a lot of people's stories around you, those who are addicted to stuff. And I know a little bit about your story and how God has rescued you, that your story is going to test to be a testimony to many people around you. And even in the next three months, like I see those people that you're working with at the drug rehab, I see lots of them come, coming to Jesus, lots of them coming off meth and all those things that you were addicted to, like God has set you free so that other people can set free. Why don't you stretch out your hands to Nicholas right now. God, we just thank you for this man. I thank you that you rescued him from hell and you brought him into heaven, Jesus. I pray that his story would be many people's stories, God, that his story would be many people's stories in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right. Thank you, guys. We're going to go to church news. Hi, Bethel family. We've got some updates for you. Here's this week's church news. Bethel Conservatory of the Arts presents Ellis Island. Join us for the premiere of a BCA original production written by the class of 2024. Under the direction of Lisa Neronia, you're invited to journey back in time with a group of immigrants searching for a hope-filled America. Get your tickets and learn more at Bethel.com forward slash church news. It's Christmas time. The Bethel Christmas Market, formerly known as Bazaar Bethel. No. Or no, Bethel, Bethel Bazaar. Bazaar. <laughs> One of our favorite Bethel holiday events. It's happening this upcoming Saturday, December 2nd. Bring your friends, enjoy the Christmas music, browsing handcrafted goods and delicious food. We can't wait to have some holiday fun together. For more information about this event, go to Bethel.com forward slash holidays. Come and explore and immerse yourself in the love of God while you and I get to experience an augmented reality of the nativity scene. You'll have an opportunity to step inside the story, explore the vibrant scenes, and celebrate the miraculous birth of Jesus in this groundbreaking interactive event. For more information, go to Bethel.com forward slash holidays. Join the Bethel Outreach team as we love and serve our Reading community this holiday season at the 28th Annual Holiday 
feast that is something to celebrate. It will be a festive day of eating and presents for children, activities, and so much more. For more information on how you can serve and donate, go to Bethel.com slash holidays. And that's it for church news this week. If you missed any of these announcements, you can go to Bethel.com slash church news to learn more. Have a wonderful week. And remember, Christmas is still in four weeks time. Uh, <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> Hello, hello, hello. It is offering time tonight, and I just wanted to share with you guys a testimony of provision, uh, miraculous provision from the Lord. And so one time I was on the streets out with some friends, ministering, doing some evangelism, and I approached this guy. I tap him on the shoulder and say, hi, my name's Alyssa. It was at a cross light. The light was about to turn. And I said, hey, can I pray for you for anything? And he says, hey, yeah, I'd love for you to pray for all the evil in the world to go away. And so... I was like, yeah, sure, I'll pray for you. Can I pray for you right now? I think he thought he was gonna get out of it. And he's like, oh, yeah, okay. And so I put my, ask him if I can put my hand on him, and I'm praying for him. And I ask the Holy Spirit whilst I'm praying for him, Holy Spirit, what do you have for this man? And he says, this man needs financial breakthrough. And so as I'm praying for this man, and I say, Jesus, I ask for financial breakthrough, he runs away. And I turn around, and I'm in utter shock, and all of a sudden I see all this money flying through the sky. This car had just thrown out cash outside of the window. I know, wild, wild. So I'm scooping up this cash on the ground and I'm giving it to him. And it was the perfect open door to preach the gospel to this man. And a perfect place to actually set, tell him that there is a God that sees him and there is a God that knows him and knows that there is financial breakthrough that he needs. I gather two of my other friends, Clint and Callie, I bring them over and whilst we're telling him about Jesus, he had never heard the gospel before, the, um, the car comes around a second time and the money flies right at us that time and I'm giving him the gospel I'm giving we're sharing the gospel with him and I'm giving him this cash and he is just utterly amazed utterly in shock in shock about the provision of the Lord the provision of the Lord and and so we get to share with him he receives the gospel the car comes around a third time <laughs> Not once, not twice, but three times. And we left that evening. He receives the Lord. He encounters the Holy Spirit personally and tangibly. And it was just a moment that I will never forget. And a moment where we all stood in awe of not only the provision of God, but also of God inviting a son into the kingdom. Uh, and it was such a beautiful, beautiful evening to remember. And so tonight, we're gonna read offering reading number one. So I wanna invite you to stand. I want you to take out your offering and I want you to read this offering in a heart posture of being in awe of who God is. I want you to declare this reading, offering reading number one, in just awe and thanksgiving of who God is. So here we go. And this will come back on the screen. As we receive today's offering, we are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest in income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decrease, blessing and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my financial needs, that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amazing, amazing. And why don't you guys go ahead and hold out your offering and put your hand on your neighbor. Uh, and we're just gonna pray. And after this, I wanna invite you to rush the buckets at the front and, that, and the screen will go back on. So Holy Spirit, 
I just declare the provision of heaven. God, I ask for the provision of heaven over this house and over each and every person in this room, God. May it be multiplied, God. May there be abundance, God. Lord, I thank you, God, for breakthrough. I thank you, God, for breakthrough over finances, breakthrough over provision, God, breakthrough over our tithe tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So why don't you guys come on forward. The buckets are up here and the screen. You can also scan the QR code at the front. You're the God of salvation. You're the great I am. You're the Alpha and Omega. We love Can we thank this worship team over here? <laughs> uh, 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 we've just had a, a feast of hors d'oeuvres and we're about to have a, a, a bit of a ma main course here. And so I turn to someone next to you and say, are you hungry? <laughs> I mean, it's like, cause you're gonna get full up today. I get the honor of introducing our speaker Great. tonight. The Bible says that if you honor a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. If you honor a righteous man, you receive a righteous man's reward. So in a moment, I'm gonna get you to get as loud as you possibly can. And it's gonna feel very natural, but it's actually supernatural. Uh, when we start to honor, it creates a flow in the spirit that what rests on someone's life will start to rest on your life. If you honor a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward, but the reverse is reward comes out of a prophet when you honor him. Yeah. And so we're going to go crazy in a couple moments, and it's going to feel so natural. It's going to be loud, your ears are going to hurt, uh, but it's going to be very supernatural. I'm setting you up to receive. This person is a leader in our house. This person has a favor outside of the house. And inside the house, she is someone that is very unique. She walks in favor with the poor and with the elite of the elite. She's walked uh, in favor with people in high up um, fashion magazines to Hollywood, all the way to uh, being with orphans and being on the streets and skid row. Uh, she's a woman who carries the love of Jesus yeah. and true wisdom through her words. Um, she has a wonderful accent too. So <laughs> when I count to three, we're going to go absolutely crazy with honor and celebration for Calorie Lloyd. So one, two, and three. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Wow. I am so scared. Okay. I've never been this nervous before in my life. I'm not joking. What am I doing to the microphone? Am I doing something naughty? Naughty. Probably. 
I'm British. And I just wanted to apologize for all the things we've done a very long time ago. I'm learning for my citizenship exam right now. And um, I didn't realize that we Brits lost the wars. I didn't know that. We were only told about the ones we won. So when it came to Independence Day, I was like, what on earth are we doing? Do you tell me more? So um, I, um, I, I'm sorry for all the things. <laughs> And uh, I have a lot more apologies to do because I haven't met all the Americans yet, but I'm going around America just apologizing. <laughs> I think it's important. Um, before we begin, I've been practicing this all day. Where's the camera? This is online, right? Over here. Here we go. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the deaf community <laughs> watching online. I'm learning sign language, but I'm slow. <laughs> so that's all, that's all we're doing tonight. <laughs> the only words you need to know are Jesus and kindness. They'll get you a long way in life, just those two. Um, the Lord actually told me about three months ago, you need to start learning sign language. And I thought, why? I don't have anyone in my world that needs me to sign. And then about two weeks ago, one of my former bosses, uh, she's raising money, millions for a film right now. And she said, Carrie, I need you to work on this script. And it's basically, it's got more of the deaf community than any other Hollywood film has ever had in history, it's a historical movement that this script is doing. She said, I'd love you to just work on some of the notes and just give me some of your feedback. So now I finally have someone coming into my world. The writer is deaf. And so um, I've been so grateful for the Lord giving me a heads up because sometimes he doesn't. <laughs> but I'm very glad when he does. So, okay. Um, I was an RG in this environment. I then was an RG uh, for Bethel Leaders Network. So I was working with people across America and it was just so fascinating to watch the patterns of what the Lord was doing over America. Some of you may know me as Bill's stylist. <laughs> and... You're welcome. Oh, gosh. Whew. Just wanted to get that out there. I'm not taking any more clients. This is enough, you know. It's a working process. We're getting there in the end. I do want to give two gifts away because my publishers say I never plug anything, so here we go. Noble Renaissance is a book I wrote in 2020. I did it with HarperCollins, but we never really gave it a book release because it was around the time that George Floyd and all of that journey it was the 2nd of June, actually, in 2020. Um, but funnily enough, the first line in this is, Noble character is seen in the kneeling of Martin Luther King Jr. So this is basically a book about character and noble character. What is it that builds the muscle of nobility? I feel like it's a lost virtue that I think we need to claim back. And I want there to be a renaissance in it. Because one of the things that I've noticed massively was I was hardcore religious as a kid, but zero character. So I wasn't a very good representation for the gospel, to be honest with you. And that's gonna be some of the journey that I'm talking about tonight. I'm gonna to talk about deconstruction. Fun. I actually said this to Bill and he went, oh, I don't think I want to. And then I went, all oh, reconstruction, that we can look at that too. Um, it's a hot topic of this particular era, but it's been around for thousands of years. So let's not flatter ourselves. We think we've come up with a new something. But we, we're in this journey now that I think more than ever before, we need to really look at character. So who of you doesn't have character that would like to have this? I love people like, 
much, you, my love, not because I think you don't have any character, <laughs> because all the pastors are raving about you on the front row, because of the word that was on your life. Thank you. Thank you. You're wonderful. Thank you. Wow, a special lady. She's a special one, huh? Are there anyone, is there anyone here that has, um, is fostering or is a foster parent or has adopted? Anyone here? Shame on you, all of you. No, I'm joking. Um, oh, hello, my love. Come. This is for you. This, wait, a friend? Someone that you know? Someone nearby? <laughs> you? Okay, great. Um, this is the Legacy Letters. It's a lovely little book that I started asking my mother questions about six years ago. And I told her just to fill in these questions, answer things. It's a prompted journal, basically. And there are questions that I wish I'd asked my father years ago before he died. But it's actually brought out some fascinating things in me. Are you a foster? What's the story? Do you mind if I ask? You're adopted. I'm not adopted. You're ad I've adopted. You've adopted a child. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Okay, so, well, my gosh, there's something about your life and how you see her now and the journey of bringing her up, but I also think there's something, I'm actually going to get you a second book. Is there, um, is there a relative or is there anyone that she knows, someone that she's inspired by? Because I want to give her another book to give to somebody else so she's got as much principles of life to live with. So find us afterwards and I'm going to give you another one. I just felt like I was supposed to give you two. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Oh, it's magical. One of the beautiful things about YouTube is that we do have subtitles. Um, we didn't have to, we would have been here for days if I was going to sign all of that. Um, but one of the things I do feel slightly concerned about is that we don't actually have signers at the moment. And if you know of anyone that is fluent in interpreting sign language, then would you get in touch with me somehow? Because we really would like to have some signers here. Um, and I will pay your, for your time and, uh, and the journey of like, speaking online. And one of the reasons why I say that is because the last time my mother saw me preach through YouTube, um, I was talking about the book of Daniel. But my mother called me and said, by the way, YouTube said that you were talking about the book of Stanley. For a whole hour, I was talking about the book of Stanley. So, I'd like us to turn to the book of Clive this evening. <laughs> if you can't find it, I can't help you. I don't, obviously don't know your Bibles. Proverbs 18.1. It's funny, actually, I was doing some thinking on this this week, and um, Danny Silk actually did something on this exact phrase, so I think there's something on it at the moment. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but express, in expressing his own heart. I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about um, my history, my journey. I've been an atheist, a very strong, mad, angry atheist. I've been very, very religious, and hopefully I'm somewhere in the middle at the moment. I'm not going to talk so much about the deconstruction. I might touch on it, but I want to talk more about extremism and what's happening in today's climate. My mother's side of the family were all hardcore legalistic, very religious, and they wouldn't sit on comfortable chairs on a Sunday. They only sat on wooden chairs, and they walked to church for an hour, walked back from church three times on a Sunday. No one got baptized because no one was holy enough. And the Sunday school teacher who had served the church for 25 years was finally allowed to be baptized, but he nearly drowned during the process. So they decided that it was wise and just no more baptisms. We're not doing any more now forever. That was that side. It got easier. By the time it got to my grandparents, my mother, we were, we were, we were calmer and more in touch with the Lord's kindness. And then you've got my father's side that were hardcore atheists. And Harry Lloyd, who was my grandfather, was a politician, um, great, but brought up by lots of different scientists and politicians were on that side. 
And my father and my uncle were both mathematicians at Oxford Balliol, highly, highly intelligent men. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about a little bit is some of this high in intellectual thinking that has been going around for years and years and centuries. And my father at the time, we're talking sort of late 60s, was studying at Oxford Balliol. <laughs> he was studying mathematics and preaching and teaching mathematics in German. Bertrand Russell, who was known as the atheist at the time, probably one of the most famous atheists on the planet during that particular era, a very profound thinker. On top of that, you also had F.F. F. Bruce, who was an apologist, someone that has done some phenomenal Bible commentaries. He's known as one of the most accurate historical commentaries on the Bible, and at that time was the most profound voice probably for apologetics. F.F. F. Bruce and Bertrand Russell decided to do a debate one night in Oxford, and my father knew exactly who he was going to support, which was Bertrand Russell. Over that particular evening, there was always something on my father where he was just so mesmerized by the kindness of people, even though he was an atheist. And during the procession of that particular night, Bertrand Russell making these fascinating thoughts. One of them was that if you don't actually see it in front of you, it doesn't exist. That actually whatever we see, we embody and create as its own existence, but it doesn't exist behind us. F.F. F. Bruce, meanwhile, is a very gentle, tender speaker, very kind, very soft, but poignant in what he's sharing. And my father is getting more and more mesmerized by F.F. F. Bruce over the evening. But what's interesting to me is he basically says this in a Q&A. My father gets up quite timidly. Bertrand Russell sort of looks at him and he says, what is it, boy? And my father goes, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you made some great points and I'd like to thank you very much. And in the whole thing non-existing, I, I get that. But I'm just trying to work out who's eating the cat food when I put it down in the morning if nothing exists behind me. <laughs> and Bertrand Russell was like, okay, oh, F.F. Bruce. Also going, good one, love that. And there is something really beautiful in that particular evening. My father followed F.F. F. Bruce's kindness, gave up his Balliol degree, decided he did not want to study mathematics, like his older brother, who had gone on to basically develop the reliability program for the first rocket that landed on the moon for NASA. If you don't believe in the moon landing, he was doing a lot of algebra on a chalkboard for most of his life. <laughs> it depends on what you feel. Um, but there's this sweet little journey where my father goes and studies under F.F. F. Bruce in theology. His convert was that night, his whole conversion. Then he and I in our journey of me growing up, I was fascinated with conversion stories, just so, especially those hardcore ones where people are adamant and sticking to their guns. And there's something really stunning, actually, about this. I actually found this week this gorgeous um, quote by, dare I say it, the Apostle Clint Eastwood. He, <laughs> so it's legit. Uh, he basically said this, extremism is so easy You've got your position and that's it. It doesn't take much thought. And when you go far enough to the right, you meet the same idiots coming from the left. <laughs> yeah. And I have to say the journey of this extremism, my grandfather on the atheist side did actually play the organ for a little bit at church. You know, it's when everyone was going to church at this particular time. But my grandfather decided to leave because he didn't like how dirty the pastor's shoes were. That was his reason. That's why, that's why he never went back to church. So pastors, let this be a lesson to you. Make sure you have clean shoes. You know? For most of my father's and for most of my grandfather's life, he was arguing with my father for years, decades, over the poor choice of career that my father decided to become a Baptist minister. And by the time I came into the picture in the 80s, um, my father and mother were both head on into being Baptist ministers and 
as an only child, I sort of, my imagination got the better of me. And I didn't really know what was going on in baptisms. I, I had no clue. I thought my dad was half drowning people. And then my mother was on the other side with a towel celebrating that they survived. I didn't, no one actually told me what a baptism was. And so in, in this space, in this journey, I developed this very interesting concept of the Old Testament. I sort of, I sort of left the New Testament out. I didn't really need that. You know, the Old Testament had a good amount of stories in it, and I didn't. So you can imagine some of the fear, the fear and trembling that I created of myself. This wasn't something my parents taught me. This was something I did in my own creative imagination and really miscontextualized the Scripture. You can imagine, therefore, when we're dealing with people that are going through deconstruction, especially someone like me who is hardcore legalistic, I didn't have an intimate relationship with the Lord to fight when I was having a difficult time. I was performing for him. I was constantly wanting to earn his love, but I didn't really know how to or what to do with that. I, I, I sometimes thought I got closer and then I would make a mistake or do something that would tear me away from him. The earning factor, the performance, I love the fact that was in the worship today. There's something about that that I think sometimes we rush to the structure of a church for safety and we think that that's enough. And so here I am, having a lovely childhood, doing everything right, being Miss Goody Two-Shoes, and my father dies very suddenly at the age of 23, um, like an afternoon nap kind of thing. And I remember being in front of my father's coffin and there were some flowers on top of the coffin. And the flowers started to shake about 15 minutes into the service. And I thought, I, is, this a, is, dad, is, is this like the ultimate practical joke that my dad's playing on me? Because he was like that, to be honest with you. Um, maybe, you know. And uh, out of the flowers came this white butterfly and it flew over our heads and into the steeple. And I thought, I'm sure that should mean something. I'm sure that's supposed to mean something, but I don't know what it means. That was the age of 23. I lost both other uncles, two separate friends in motorbike accidents, and another grandparent. By the time I was 24, 25, I was now just surrounded by death and tragedy. And of course, when I was praying, I, I wasn't really getting anything back. I didn't feel anything. What I didn't realize is how angry I was. And it was causing such a filter between me and him that I couldn't hear him anymore. And I remember calling a philosopher friend from Cambridge who was a best friend of my father's. And I, I said, I need to meet you for a coffee. And I need you to convince me of the existence of God. I was so furious. I was mad that I didn't even get to say goodbye to my dad. Like, it, at least give me that. The next thing I know is that he sits there and he listens for four hours about my understanding of what God is. And he said, I think you need to redeem yourself of your version of God. Because your version of God, I don't think will help you get through such a time as this. It was a brave move because I knew I didn't want to have a secondhand faith. I loved my parents, but I didn't want a secondhand faith. It was really important that I made the decision to go out of that hotel that day. And I remember leaving, the, exiting that hotel, and it was black and white, monochrome. Everything outside had no meaning. It was a choice because I knew out of the threshold of this hotel, I won't see my father again. But I was that mad and that furious and that extreme that I didn't want any more wisdom. I wanted fun. I wanted to see what life might be different without a God. And it was a very stupid time, no. I, it was a very, well it was. Um, but I remember pockets of moments where I felt this sort of sense of force trying to go after me. And I couldn't give up giving up. I still had this thing of like, I was reading all the new atheists, the new, new atheists, anyone that was, prefer you know, at that time it was books, but this time it would have been TikTok, you know. And my friends had been really lovely to me and been very close to me and very kind. And one day I was lovely and the next minute I'm, hi, I'm off with them because they represent something different than I believe. 
And I noticed there was this wall that I had placed up, not because, not because I thought they were going to have an agenda and try and convert me back to being a Christian, but because I looked down on them. I thought they were stupid. Awful, really. I feel like even as I'm saying this, there are, for some of you tonight, there are names coming through your head about people you've had conversations with, relatives, children, people that have been very close to you and have gone through this journey of deconstruction. We've become supercilious in the way that we approach you guys as Christians. And at the same time, I also had very hardcore legalistic references that were proving my point even more. You see? You see? There's pride, there's power, there's all this stuff that doesn't, doesn't represent Jesus. So I, yeah, I like Jesus, I think he's all right, he's a great guy, but I don't want to get involved in that. It was aggressive. I was that person that would be in a pub and I would argue a Christian under the table. I was using their gospel against them. As, it, as you can tell, it worked out really well. The ending gets <laughs> changes. And I might have felt puffed up for a minute, I'm proud of myself because I slayed them with a witty quit, but it didn't didn't last, and I was empty, and I was alone. You know, and then I sort of explored other religions. I even thought about reincarnation until I stepped on a snail. (laughs) And I thought, well, that could have been my dad. That doesn't work for me. I don't, I don't want that. And then I became obsessed with kindness. Oh. (laughs) There's a substance to it. Because so much as I could be reading these atheists and new new atheists and talking about the fact that someone else is eating my cat food, it doesn't bring me back to why do I cry when I see the person who doesn't deserve forgiveness, be forgiven. I loved what Chris spoke about this morning. I remember going in this gallery and it was called the F word. And I thought, I don't think that's appropriate, but sure, I'll go and have a look. And it was all these photographs of people that had forgiven, people that had taken them hostage, people that had murdered their son. The story of how these people had forgiven over and over again. And I'm like, why am I this moved? by kindness if there isn't something out there that cares for it. And so you can imagine who he brought me back to, which was the book of Clive. No, I mean, (laughs) Jesus. But this time I was looking at historical accounts of Jesus outside of the Bible, Josephus, historians that had written about Jesus and the magnitude of who he was and what he was up to because I had overloaded on the scriptures and I'd used it as a weapon almost against myself and of course to other people. So now I was just studying Jesus. Now I was interested in who he was and he kept on talking about how the Father sees the details in our life And there I am, after working in film and TV, the most decadent industry you can imagine. The Me Too movement did not exist then. And I'm sitting at the back of my mother's garden one summer afternoon. I'm now probably 28, 29. And I'm smoking my 20th cigarette of the day. And this intrigue about kindness just gets me. And all of a sudden I go, you know, you and I haven't talked for a while. I could almost feel like the Lord's going, wait a minute, she's ta- hang on, she's talking. <laughs> I mean, it's beyond my eyes. I've never seen anything like this before, you know. <laughs> so you see the details, it seems, on Jesus' life. As a father, you seem to be very good to him. He keeps on talking about you all the time. I'm not sure you saw the details on my life. I don't know if you saw the details on my life. I don't want that to be a statement. I want it to be a question. Can you show me that you know the details on my life? I closed my eyes ago and that was a stupid thing to say. (laughs) I exhale and I feel something on my nose. And it's a white butterfly. Oh, that was good. (laughs) 
That was really good. And she felt that was really good. It took me a long time to make my way back to him. I had to relearn everything because I was so extreme. I was playing hopscotch at seven, telling my friends that their grandma probably was going to hell if they didn't get saved. Like I didn't have any sense of diplomacy, you know, <laughs> which is surprising because I'm British and we never share our feelings. This is why I moved to America. Um, <laughs> Probably best I know, it's, it's profound. Um, <laughs> the reason why I share about that a little bit is, is actually to bring encouragement because I think there have been people that we've probably been praying for for years. People that we, it's not even necessary that they believe in the same things that we do, but this bitterness, this extremism, this absolute rigidity on what the life is and what this means and the re refusal to have a conversation, to have a discussion. And I was talking with some of the pastors last night and um, one of them was saying, you know, we think probably about 50% of deconstruction comes from church hurts. Yeah. 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 And that's painful to discuss as pastors. And we all kind of raise our hand going, yeah, there are a lot of conversations that we would have done very differently. But in the moment, we're not quite aware of what we're doing sometimes. It's not because we're just thoughtless. It's more the fact that sometimes our own humanity gets involved and we start to want to protect our, protect our position, our reputation. We don't want people to think that we would ever do anything like that and we gaslight people. There are times where people are actually wanting to have a conversation. You go, hey, you said something or did something and that really hurt me and we're not listening. If we are listening, perhaps not for long enough. There's a substance in his kindness, and kindness listens. There's another really beautiful story, and one of my favorite conversion stories is a guy called Malcolm Muggridge, who you may or may not know him, but he was British, a drinking, womanizing, smoking guy back in the day. He was a phenomenal broadcaster for the BBC. Beautiful voice. And he'd been communicating and articulating for years as an atheist, really profound in his thoughts. But he got really interested in about six people that carried a faith that did things that he couldn't even esteem to do. He couldn't understand the courage of some of these Christians. He couldn't understand the sacrifice of some of these Christians, especially Mother Teresa. So he follows her. He makes a documentary on her. And he spends about three months at the home for the destitute and dying. It's a very happy place, it's not. It's, it's the darkest parts of humanity, right there. Mother Teresa only owns two saris and a bucket. One to wear and one to wash. She's a tiny little thing, she's about four foot two. My father had a rehabilitation center around the corner from her hospital. Um, for leprosy patients, people that have been completely ostracized and outcast from society. Leprosy still has the worst stigma in the world. It's still existing. It goes under Hansen's disease in other countries because it's got such a bad stigma. One particular day, Malcolm Muggridge is watching Mother Teresa and she is talking to some other sisters around her and they're talking about what they're going to do about this particular man in the corner who's completely blind, boils all over his skin and body. He's got stumps for hands and feet. He's got three hours to live. And Malcolm Muggridge goes out to Mother Teresa and says, what's going on, what's happening? And she said, we're just trying to work out what to do with him because he's got about three hours. I'm just trying to work out what, what would be nice and pleasant for him for his last three hours. She thinks for a minute and then, she looks at Malcolm. She said, you know, that man hasn't had anyone else touch him other than us for 10 years. No one else has wanted to touch him because of the stigma. So I think you should go and touch him. He's like, I, I don't think that's a very good idea. I don't know. I'm just here to watch, you know. Just going to take it by the sidelines. Just thank you very much. 
No, no, you're going to go and touch him. You're going to go and sit in the corner with him. No, 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 I don't. Again, I'm just producing, just broadcasting. We don't need to, you know, you go do you, I'll do me, okay? And then she goes up to him. I wouldn't try this at home. This is not an ethical way of bringing someone to the Lord, just to say. But she's Mother Teresa and she's four foot two. So she's probably just less intimidating, I don't know. But she grabs him by the collar. I don't know how, I'm about 5'11". That isn't his face. That's Christ's face. And those aren't his stumps. They're Christ's. Now go. And she throws him into the corner with this guy. This guy can feel the masculine presence of Malcolm Muggridge. And he just starts crying. Because he's finally embraced. He's brought in. He's loved. For the first time in decades. Malcolm holds him for those full three hours. And as they're both crying, Malcolm goes, that was the moment that I discovered the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It only takes one conversation, but it has to be done at the right time. And it has to be when they're open, when they're hungry. There have been plenty of times that I was an idiot as a pastor and we're trying to force in an idea or a theology. You know, come on, let's go. You know, I don't know why I'm sounding like Winston Churchill all of a sudden. <laughs> that's what it sounds like. So I was like that when they were like, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't want to. And I sort of forgot about the freedom of choice that the Lord had given me for years. He waited. The prodigal father didn't run into town and bash on all the doors to try and find out where his son was. He waited for him to come home. He allowed choice. And I think as an atheist, I could feel the agenda on us. And I didn't feel known. I didn't feel understood. And no one was holding the pain of where I'd got to. I'm like, I've been you. I've done all the stuff you're about to do. Good try, nice try. It's not going to work. It becomes, on both sides, on both extremes, it becomes incredibly condescending to both sides. You have to also make sure that you're strong enough and brave enough to sit in those conversations. One of the most important things that I think this generation has stopped doing is staying in the room. Cancel culture is on fire. And it doesn't do anything for them. It doesn't do anything for us. It's just creating more and more division everywhere. Some of the most profound moments of the world changing have been with people in rooms that don't agree with each other figuring out a solution. I'm so tired of seeing this happen and both believe they're fighting for Jesus. Jesus sat at a well and waited for the one woman that no one else was talking to. He waited at the hottest part of day where he could have just gone for lunch which I probably would have done. <laughs> Actually, let's go to John 4, can we? Yeah. You guys doing okay? So Trying to translate the accent, I get it. I'm going to dart over this a little bit and probably interrupt it occasionally, but ah, let's go to... Let's go to just 4 verse 7. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. When the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? First shot that she took. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. If you really look into the context of the conversation, it's pretty tense. <laughs> It's, she's pretty feisty. And understandably, this is an era where women were not allowed a voice. We were not allowed to be in court. We were seen as untrustworthy and unreliable. And I agree. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I'm just trying to lighten the mood there. Um, 
she didn't have a voice. Some, a lot of times, I, I just want us to be really careful. Even on translation, sometimes she's called the adulteress. We don't actually know how those five divorces happened or were they widowed. I don't know. We just don't know. We don't even know her name. I mean, she's one of the first ones I want to meet in heaven, to be honest with you. I'd love to know her story, all the parts that we didn't see here. But this is one of my go-to pieces of dialogue between Jesus and somebody else in regards to a difficult conversation. Because you'll see within it how brilliant he is. The woman said to him, sir, oh no, sorry, I missed, I missed the part where Jesus talked. Sorry about that. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob shot to? who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Rumor had it that that well that she's going to was not her local some scholars say that she had to, well, firstly, she's also coming at the hottest part of the day. Women would come at the first break of dawn because it was much cooler. So she's going at the hottest time of day and not to her local well, i.e. she was completely outcast. No one wanted to talk to her. And also, they're normally, women were normally accompanied to the well. So just so you know, there's a lot of factors here that you have to understand the pain she's kind of carrying, the loneliness. By the way, loneliness is as damaging I learned this the other week. Loneliness is as damaging to the body as smoking two packets of cigarettes a day. Wow. Just so you know. And I'm not suggesting that you can just pick up smoking now because, <laughs> you know, you're not lonely. Like, well, let's just be clear about that. <laughs> Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. Why, just out of interest, why would you tell someone to go and fetch your husband when you're about to prophesy? That's right, because you don't have a husband. You live with the person you're with, but you're not married. Why would you do that? Unless you're wanting to see if she's going to tell the truth. So this is where the make or break moment was, I think, in the dialogue. If she had lied, I'm not so sure this would have carried on. She went, I don't have a husband that you speak truly. Disco, bingo, now we can go. She's honest with herself, brilliant, great. First step of actual growth is truth about yourself, not just necessarily everyone else. It took me a long time to learn that one. It's really easy to blame everyone else, isn't it? So much easier. <sighs> Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in, in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. She's still disassociating herself from him. She's still identifying herself with being something different. But you notice that Jesus doesn't go into that part. He doesn't go into that part of the conversation. He keeps focused on what she needs. And he knows that she's not satisfied. And so that's what he keeps on pointing to. You're in pain, sweetheart. You're in pain. And so he kind of lets these things not really offend him, thankfully. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know that what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. If we're gonna deconstruct, you better do it in truth. 
And that requires other people to have conversations with you. And there are times that we may have abused in our own. See, the thing is, if we have any sense of position in their life, whether it's a leader, a boss, a parent, we have to be the ones that get lower because we are just by natural effect more intimidating to them, whether we want to be or not. It's the position. So we as leaders, and I've been so grateful for this environment that I've seen leaders go, sorry, I got that wrong. It's incredibly healing when leaders say sorry. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, oh, this is a moment. I who speak to you am he. What a moment. That was my, oh, that was good. That was my moment. This is her moment. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot. There was just that moment. It's you. I've been waiting for you for a long time. And I've been so phased by all of my belief and what I am and who I am and what you're not and what I am. And now I've just realized it's you. What I love about this is that as she goes away, she leaves her water pot behind it's a lovely picture. She came all that way in the hottest part of day. She didn't need it anymore because she was so mesmerized by the presence of the Lord. One conversation can change an entire city. On truthful ownership of her, I don't have a husband. You speak truly. If you are deconstructing, please own your own journey too not just what everyone else is doing. You have to own your own pain. You have to remove your cloak, just like Bartimaeus did, before he gets, he gets any healing. Right? Blind beggars were given official cloaks to wear when they're begging for money. It was a sort of official badge of honor that they could receive money from other passers-by, by judges. Now he's there as Jesus is walking by. He hears, hears all the commotion. What's going on? What's going on? Jesus of Nazareth is walking by. He screams out. Jesus hears him. Jesus says, come to me. And he takes off his cloak. It's not an identity that he's holding anymore. And he chose to remove that identity. Not Jesus after the healing, before. Before. So all of us have to own this journey so that we can stay in the room. I have to come with moments where I go, I'm so sorry. I think I could have done that better. I'm so sorry. And equally, hey, are you willing to hear some parts that I think perhaps you could have done better with me? Is it possible we can have this exchange where we actually meet each other in the middle? I'm on a board right now of a charity for fostering and within that charity, there are quite a lot of liberals, quite a lot of Republicans. And I thought, oh, this will be interesting. It was beautiful. It was so beautiful because everyone on this call cared about the most important thing, which in this particular conversation were vulnerable children. They all came with solutions. We all listened to each other. And it's one of the most successful foster char charities in America. It's really important we start to put aside what we believe to be a label on ourselves and identify ourselves and then move over into this space where we might actually start listening. We can't expect people to listen to us in the church if we're not listening to them. We can't expect people to apologize to us if we're not willing to apologize to them. Having said that, just because I can feel some of this stuff coming up, there are times where we need to keep a little bit of a distance for safety until we find a bit of healing so we can get stronger, more brave in the conversation so we're not projecting. There are times where we'll have students even come to this church and they've had such a hard journey in the church. They have a lot of healing sometimes. And then there will also be times where this part is not being let go of and then they're projecting onto other people in this environment. 
also vice versa. If we're not careful, we can start to label similar types of students that have done things through our past and our journey. We get walled up ourselves as leaders. We have to keep the conversation open. And we have to recognize, we have to keep accountability with each other to go, do I believe in this kid? Or have I put myself in the way? We've got to get out of the way. 2 Timothy talks about um, being strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think sometimes we're trying to get cozy in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're actually requested to have some really beautiful conversations that are deeply, deeply hard. I've got friends that have been atheists for years. I've got one that I've known her since I was eight years of age. She just started going to church and she's 45. And she called me up one day. I could, my mouth just dropped to the floor. She went, you know, Carrie, um, so I went to church. And I went, I'm sorry, sorry, what did you just say? <laughs> yeah, I went to church and I'm just trying to get this whole thing around the Jesus thing. Like, just trying to work that one out. And we had the most beautiful conversation. It wasn't one that I forced. I left the door open but it wasn't one I forced. And I just always wanted to make sure that I was there throughout her entire life. She was there for me and mine. Just keep the door ajar, but with your kindness. No other, no other conversation needs to be happen. Serve and you'll find some healing. And there are times that we're getting so opinionated on what we feel, but that I'm going, can you help by any chance just help with this sort of vulnerable orphan thing campaign that I'm trying to work on? And they didn't want to associate themselves because this person that might be in a promo was known as a Republican. So then they're not having anything to do with them. So let me just get this straight. You're not even associating yourself. Even if you believe in the same thing, you're not associating yourself because of what they represent well, that could have happened here at the well. But guess what? They both showed up. And they focused on other things, other people. She, in the encounter, in her intimacy with the Messiah, runs and tells everyone. Not because she's like, I must be an evangelist. Like, I must, let's get the numbers in. Like, it's not that. <laughs> She wasn't given like a sales target of how many to get up there. Like it wasn't, that's not the agenda. <laughs> There's something, there is something really stunning actually written about that particular interaction. And I have to share it with you because I do every time whenever I speak about it. And it's um, written by an Assyrian writer. Um, and they say this, at the beginning of the conversation, Jesus didn't make himself known to her kind of important but she first caught sight of a thirsty man then a Jew then a rabbi afterward a prophet last of all a messiah she tried to get the better of a thirsty man she showed dislike of the Jew she heckled the rabbi she was swept off her feet by the prophet and she adored the Christ one conversation, if done right, can heal, can change the trajectory of your entire life. Speaking of time frames, my father and grandfather over the journey, my father just kept on loving my grandfather as much as possible and ensuring that he always had clean shoes in front of his father. <laughs> but my grandfather got very, very ill. He had a stroke. And all of a sudden, he wasn't quite as robust and strong as he used to be. Now he needed help and care. My father decided to take care of him and have them move into the city where my mother and father were, and I was two at the time. And about five weeks before my grandfather passed, he decided to hand over his life to Jesus. There's a picture that I have at home framed next to my bedside table to remind me of the time and the service that my father gave my grandfather. That there's a beauty in kindness that can linger for years and decades until you might see the fruit of it, maybe even after you've gone. But you'll be remembered for kindness. You want to be remembered for kindness, not for witty quips or hilarious opinions or that you slayed someone on Instagram. That's not what you want to be remembered for. 
you want to be remembered for the person that was there at 3 a.m. in the morning when you had gunmetal in your mouth. You want to be remembered for the person that showed up in that time. You want to be the person that shows up when there's a massive divorce happening and it's just messy and crazy. You want to be the one that opens the front door to a vulnerable kid that couldn't find a parent to stay with that night. We can all do something. And I have to say that some of my greatest healing started to come when I chose to serve others again. And I know that can, ooh, I've done far too much service over the years. I had a burnout and a nervous breakdown. I get that, I understand that. But there is a posture that comes with showing up when you can, when it's possible. Even with fostering, I remember so many Christians come up to me going, oh, I don't really have the grace for that. You know, that's you. You obviously have the grace. I'm like, no, I don't, it's, no, it isn't, a, I don't have grace for it actually. Um, I just chose to say yes. And with the yes, then he gives you the grace. It's amazing how he does it. It's stunning. And I remember how terrified and nervous, almost as nervous as I was tonight, so terrified and nervous of this kid coming to my door for the first time and never fostered a kid before. I don't think I'd had a child in my house since I bought it. Like, I was just like, I don't, what do, what do they eat? I don't know what they eat. You know, I was just, had no, I, thankfully I had a crew of friends that were just there ready to do anything. Um, but that kid taught me stuff about resilience, about the ability of what we can actually get through, the power of kindness when your mother or father has got an addiction. He was so loving to his parents. He just knew that they were in a tough spot. There's something, and sometimes, you know, we sometimes have this journey where I was even sharing with a friend last night, or I think it was a couple of nights ago on for Thanksgiving, and saying, you know, with your history and your past, you could have every excuse in the book to be cruel and be unkind. But you remind me that there is such a thing as Jesus because you're so kind and kinder than any one of us often in this, in this circle of friends sometimes. You see the best in all of us. And it kind of echoes what Chris was saying this morning. There's only, sometimes it just takes one person to choose you, one person to champion you, and it melts away the bitterness, the cruelty of bitterness and what it can do to us. It's one thing that I, I want to play to you. And it's actually a, a one-minute video that I, it was, it was actually played at the Super Bowl two years ago. And I remember thinking at the time, I'm sure this was made by the boys. And the boys were who I used to work for at Saatchi and Saatchi in advertising. We were trained to do a really good story in 30 seconds to make you feel something, act on something, do something. They were some of the best advertisers in the world. And they got, they got so good at what they do, I could pitch and find an advert. I could absolutely guess an advert that was made by them without even seeing the credits. So this was played at the Super Bowl. I'm hoping that we can kind of avoid the brand advertising at the end of it, but um, <laughs> this is one minute long. And I'm hoping that we're not gonna get ourselves into trouble for playing it. Um, but just watch this. If you don't cry by the end of this, by this next minute, um, you're made of stone. So. <laughs> If we could play the video, that would be wonderful. It may not be easy, but it will be amazing. See that with everyone that comes to mind tonight, 
I see that with everyone that's deconstructing and wanting to push you away. It may not be easy, but they're really worth fighting for. If I didn't have friends that were waiting for me for all of those years, I wouldn't be up here sharing this with you now. I remember even my first interview with, with Barbara Kay. <laughs> oh my word, what a wonderful woman she was. What a nightmare I was on that interview. She said, you know, Carrie, it says here that you smoke five cigarettes a day. And, uh, you know, we're kind of trying to become like a cancer-free town here. So just wondered maybe, if you wouldn't mind awfully, uh, maybe reconsidering uh, not smoking those five cigarettes a day. And I went, oh, my gosh, I'm so embarrassed even just to share the story because you're going to think so low of me. But that's fine. I'm okay with that, you know. Humbling. At the end of this, I went, well... I mean, I will give up those five cigarettes if you're willing to give up over there in America your cancerous sugar. How does that sound? <laughs> Awful attitude. That's not the attitude we're looking for here. Thank you very much. Barbara somehow still saw something in me that had potential. And if it hadn't been for her... And for saying, come on in, there's work to do, but come on in. <laughs> I don't know what my life would have been like. Wow. Takes one conversation. And little trajectories over your life will have these opportunities where you might want to pull away because you felt judged by a non-smoker. She's the ex-smoker too. She, she gets, it's a process. It's slowly letting go. If there is someone in your mind that you're like, oh, I wish there could be a wall that crumbled so I had an opportunity to show my kindness again. Maybe it's, maybe it's us going, actually, there's one conversation that I could have done better with kindness. Maybe it's someone in your heart, someone in your mind of a distance that hasn't just pulled away, but they're extreme. And you would love to see them encounter the softness, the kindness of Jesus. If you're thinking of that in your head, I want you to stand. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, Heavenly Father, we thank you oh, for your patience. Thank you for the white butterflies, for waiting for us at the well, for waiting for us to come home when we choose to. Thank you for those that are willing to listen. Thank you that we're learning. Thank you for humility and the character of the Christians that have modeled in front of us who you really can be. I pray over us patience, but also an understanding of their pain, a compassion towards their pain and empathy that will melt everything away. And Lord, I pray if there's anything in us that is even holding back more wisdom, more insight, more availability to have the tough conversations. If we love to avoid these moments, but actually we'd love to have the tenacity, the audacity even, to have hard conversations, but we want wisdom to do it well, then Lord, just let us have it. Let us find you, let, you, let us just encounter you in this moment. Because we wanna be like you. I felt, I felt like there are some people that actually were like, I wish I could have had that conversation, but actually they've gone. We didn't end great. I felt like for you, I need you to understand how the conversation's coming. <laughs> it's just not right now. That there's actually, I, I pray for a wider understanding and mindset of what eternity actually does. That there are conversations you never got to finish well here, but you'll get to have them in heaven that you get to smash into these people that you've been longing to have a final conversation. I've even had encounters where I remember 
having this encounter because I never got to have a conversation with my father and I so badly wanted to just close that. And I remember in the moment, just he was riding on a motorbike, a platinum motorbike. It was awesome. And he felt like it was five minutes. I knew it had been decades. But the weight came off my shoulders when I knew, A, that he was okay, but B, that I transitioned my face on what I was losing to the face of the father that has been fighting for me since the day I was even conceived, before I was even conceived, our heavenly father was fighting for me and I was realigned back to his face, not just my father, but him, my heavenly father. I forgot. I got so mesmerized by this. I forgot about him. And so I pray for divine encounters that make you feel the presence of the Lord so much that you're not worried about having hard conversations because actually most of the time it's not about us. So, Lord, will you just fill this space, fill this room? I remember seeing the glory cloud over there years ago, and I was in a foul mood. I know it sounds surprising. I was in a foul mood, and I just wanted to go home and hang out with the girls, but I'd never seen the glory cloud before. In fact, I prayed very hard that it would show up tonight so I wouldn't have to speak, and then I wouldn't be sending them. <laughs> and I remember being at the back of the room, and all of a sudden, this sort of figure of eight started happening. There was commotion. Everyone was starting to just feel the presence of who he was. And then it was swoosh, straight over to this side and back over again. And I was like, oh, I got to go feel this. So I went over and down. And I, as soon as my body got half into the glory cloud, I fell on my knees and wept. And I went, I'm so sorry. There's something about the presence of God that makes you go, I'm so sorry. I had so much pride. I had so much going on in me. I had so much arrogance and walls and refusal to have conversations because I was in pain and I forgot about you. So Lord, let us feel your tangible presence so that when we come out, we almost remove dead skin from us. Thank you for this time. Thank you for redeeming moments. Thank you for those kind friends that have taken care of us. Put your hand on your heart, hand on a neighbor. Ministry, do we have ministry team tonight? Yes, we do, we do. Ministry team, if you want to come up, I'd love you to come up here. Thank you for giving us a heart. Thank you for letting us be explorers of kindness. And Lord, I ask that in this space, that there will people go out tonight and you'll start to get phone calls and you'll start to think of people in your mind that you probably didn't want to pick up the phone to, but you know you meant to. Not because you have to do anything, just to say, hi, love you. Just letting you know I love you. I feel like there's going to be breakthrough on families. I feel like there's going to be breakthrough on children in particular. And there's going to be breakthrough on addiction. Without question. Just pray for the person next to you. Just, just really feel prophetically what you feel that you need to pray for them. Any residue of skepticism we break off. We don't need to be logical anymore. It's not worth it. For some of you are worried that the influence over your children is causing havoc. <clears throat> Just a small journey for you. My mother was so kind to me in this journey. So kind. Whatever you need to do, go and do it. When I told her I was going to be an atheist and boy, does she pray behind the doors. <laughs> but not once did she try to control me. And I feel like there are some in this room tonight that need to know you don't need to control the situation. Someone else has got it. Someone else is going to hunt after you and him and her. 
he's going to hunt them down because he's so in love with them. So Lord, we just lift our hands to you. We say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for giving us an everlasting love so that we could do the same. Say yes and amen. Thanks so much. Wow. Can we give Carrie another big hand? Thank you, John. Come on, we can do better than that. Let's honor this beautiful woman. Wow. Carrie, so, so grateful for you. You are such a treasure and a gift to this house. Thank you for sharing. I mean, how many of you that just touched your life where you're just like, oh, thank you for sharing so vulnerably, so real. Man, I just, I pray that this week that um, we would experience the tangible kindness of the Father, but then that we would go and extend that kindness, whatever, maybe it's a phone call, whatever it is, what Carrie was saying, maybe there's a family member that we need to reach out to. There's someone on the street that, Father, we want to extend the kindness that you've shown us. And so I pray, Jesus, that you do it in us first and that we would go and love radically the way that you love us. Amen? Amen. Well, we have the ministry team here. If you're a second or third year student or on the ministry team, we welcome you to go ahead and come on up. Um, I, I really do want to uh, go after families and marriages and restoration and marriages um, tonight. But if you have any need, any of you're like, man, I need a miracle in my body. We wanna stand with you in faith tonight, believing for that. So um, our uh, ministry team has their hands raised. Go ahead and come on up. And when you see a hand raised, they would love to pray with you. Bless you guys. Go and share the kindness of the Lord with those around you. We love you. Have a wonderful rest of your night.